There are many ways by which the powers that be trick you into working against your interests. They convince you they represent you. They scare you into believing you could never challenge them. They teach you things have always been this way, or things are better now, and now it's the way things should be, so you should just accept it. They sell you hope for the future with words like progress. They tell you you're lucky to have rulers as benign as them. And they convince you you're lucky, or that your country is a unique case, by talking about other parts of the world. And that's what we're talking about today. They teach us to say, the system isn't perfect, but it's better than over there or in that time, so things could always be worse. This way of thinking I'm going to call over thereism. Anytime someone wants to improve anything, we hear a comparison with something bad that happened in a different time and place. It's a way to shut someone up. What you're advocating is exactly like this other thing that we've all agreed is bad. In this culture, the other thing is usually Nazi Germany or Stalin's Russia or Mao's China. Those are pretty much the three examples from history that everyone brings up. It's so boring hearing the same spurious comparisons in every argument. So you want universal health care? So basically you want to bring back Stalin? Of course, anybody can use an other to deceive or convince you. Your parents might point to another kid and say, why can't you be more like him? But the foreign enemy is more of a threat because its stature can be magnified to cartoonish proportions and hardly anyone can argue against it because it's so much harder to verify. Even in the days of the internet, when we search for information about another country, Google starts with sources like the BBC, the New York Times, and the CIA Factbook, rather than regular people who can explain their side. The media always give us examples of bad things happening in other countries, making us feel like the situation is a problem over there. Over here, we might have the same problems, but they're much worse over there. We're expected to feel lucky and grateful and not worry about the same thing here. People might even tell you to stop complaining just because things are worse somewhere else in the world, as if injustice could only exist in one place at any given time and sympathy is in short supply. I think we need to be more aware of our ethnocentrism. In case you don't know that word, ethnocentrism is basically thinking your culture is superior, or at least judging other cultures in relation to it. I don't know if it's inborn or not, but it certainly is cultivated by the people in power. As I've given more detail to in other videos, this kind of belief comes from parents, school, media, everywhere, because hardly anyone questions it. You can think about each of them, each of those institutions in your own experience, how they've taught you to think, and how it's led you to believe your culture was inherently better. A lot of our beliefs come from stories, so you can think of the stories the culture tells and where they came from, like how Columbus discovered America, or tales of plucky white pioneers defending themselves against hostile engines. Why do they use those words? Columbus invaded and colonized America. White settlers killed native people so they could take their land. But the stories never say it that way. Not in popular myth or on statues or in high school history books. They smother everything in lies and euphemisms. Certain assumptions get drawn from these stories and they inform our understanding of the world. So we think, of course there are homeless people. 
They just don't have that classic American spirit. That's the only one, only reason anyone could possibly find themselves without a home, right? But no, really, who took their home away? The bank, the landlord, the government, all three working together? And what happened to family, friends, and communities? Where did they go? Why don't we tell that story? Why do we hear some stories and not others? Why do hardly any Americans seem to know about the Battle of Blair Mountain and its implications? Why don't we hear more about how socialists and anarchists and trade unionists fought for all the rights, you know, if you can call them rights, that workers enjoy today? Why don't the stories tell about the, all the mutual aid associations in the U.S. during the 18th and 19th centuries? Until I started reading, I had only ever heard of such groups in the Flintstones, because Fred and Barney belong to the loyal order of water buffaloes. They were basically a mutual aid association where people had each other's backs. It was actually pretty typical. Nowadays, mutual aid associations are springing up again, and with some effort, they'll become permanent. But if we keep telling the story of white pioneers and cowboys, Americans will keep believing in the rugged, independent white man who's ashamed to show emotion or ask for help. But at least we still have the right to blame foreigners. Have you ever heard people, especially white Americans, complaining about how people from other countries are stealing their jobs? Their ethnocentrism taught them they were entitled to a job and a certain standard of living. Media propaganda taught them to blame immigrants and China. Effective propaganda creates and then appeals to our prejudices, then makes us think we came by those beliefs by ourselves. It must be those people over there who are to blame for my getting fired, because it couldn't possibly be our bosses who do the hiring and firing and make decisions to offshore production or hire people with the lowest possible wages. Why get mad at the people with all the money who make all the decisions when you can blame poor people from other places who can't stand up for themselves? Our propaganda-laden ethnocentrism provides us with idealized versions of the values we supposedly believe in, and an enemy that embodies the wrong values. In our country, we believe in truth and freedom and justice and puppies and rainbows. Those people hate us for believing in truth and freedom and puppies, and that's why we should hate them. Mm. Ethnocentrism teaches us hope and complacency through bad history and distracts us from problems at home. Going back to my original example, just because it's so pervasive, we're always hearing about death tolls in far removed places like Nazi Germany and Mao's China, rather than the far more relevant death tolls of the modern US. How many people has the US military killed since World War II? And how many of the places where they kill people have turned out to be democracies because of US intervention? <laughs> zero, it's zero. How many millions did the U.S. kill in Vietnam and Iraq? How many is it still killing with its bombs? Think of it another way. Americans know the history of Nazi Germany better than the history of U.S. foreign policy. But maybe you're not from the U.S., but Canada, where you hear about some police killings in the U.S., but not so much about RCMP killings of indigenous people. When Canadians hear about it, they can invoke the bad apples metaphor I talked about last week and say there should be an inquiry. For some reason, 
bad metaphors and internal investigations haven't actually turned the RCMP into a force for protecting people. Hmm. Likewise, you hear about Canada's involvement in Afghanistan, but not how many innocent people it's killed there. It's the U.S. who's the main occupier, so it's all their fault. As long as Canada's not as bad as the U.S., nothing has to be done. Ethnocentrism is built on double standards. Also in North America, you hear feminists talk about what a serious problem rape is in India. Look, it's great to stand in solidarity with feminists in India, but there's rape going on near where you live. A white person like me who's never been to India, any talk about the problems in India is likely to be infused with ethnocentrism. And it's hard to understand a problem when your vision is clouded by your own cultural standards. Unless I really get it, and in this case, I don't know how I could, I'd rather focus on problems I can understand and deal with, like sexual violence in the city where I live or the culture that I'm familiar with. I trust people on the other side of the world to deal with their problems their way and to have no need of my intervention. Being of Anglo-Saxon stock, I used to feel the opposite. I used to think it was my duty to right the injustices of the world. I come from a culture that in the past regularly invoked the white man's burden or similar rhetoric to justify intervening and eventually colonizing land all around the world. Frequently, this call to arms invoked the civilized white man's need to protect the weak from evil local practices. Gayatri Spivak called that white men saving brown women from brown men. So go find her if you want to know some more. It does more harm than good, and it's still going on in Afghanistan. We hear the same justifications the British Empire use. We have to defend the innocent in other parts of the world, especially women. It's always about women, because they're weak and innocent. <laughs> Actually, this paternalistic thinking keeps the wars going and makes things worse for everyone, especially women and girls. Let me read from J. Ann Tickner, who, of course, you can find in the description. The notion that young males fight wars to protect vulnerable groups such as women and children who cannot be expected to protect themselves has been an important motivator for the recruitment of military forces and support for wars. Feminists have challenged this protector-protected relationship with evidence of the high increase in civilian casualties documented above. As feminists have pointed out, if women are thought to be in need of protection, it's often their protectors who provide the greatest threat. Judith Steam claims that this dependent, asymmetric relationship leads to feelings of low self-esteem and little sense of responsibility on the part of women. For men, the presence of able-bodied, competent adults who are seen as dependent and incapable can contribute to misogyny. And Orford tells us that accounts of sexual assault by peacekeepers have emerged in many UN peacekeeping operations. However, such violence against women is usually dismissed as a natural outcome of the right of young soldiers to enjoy themselves. This type of behavior may also be aggravated by the misogynist training of soldiers who are taught to fight and kill through appeals to their masculinity. Such behavior further erodes the notion of protection. Protecting the innocent is one of the most common messages used to support war while being one of the least common outcomes of war. But even when the justification isn't to protect girls, it's still full of patronizing beliefs about the inability of foreign people to figure out things for themselves. We have to teach them who the bad guys are. We have to build them a new state. We have to send volunteers over to help them. We'll just be taking some of their resources as a reward. 
So this thinking along with the media's selective reporting makes us think our side, the side we've been told all our lives we belong to, is always right when dealing with the people chosen for us to be the bad guys. I know people who can name several instances, maybe all of them, where the Taliban killed innocent people and none where the international coalition has, because they only hear bad things about the bad guys, and the only time they ever hear anything bad about the good guys, it's brushed off as accidental and isolated. They punish the small number of individuals responsible for the isolated incidents, so they don't have to consider the system that created them. But when we're trying to kill the bad guys, the blood of innocence is considered an acceptable part of the process. Nowadays, most war casualties are civilians. Who are the soldiers who fight these wars? Some of them think their task is a noble one because they believe what they hear. They work for the same states that criminalize poverty and criminalize being black or native and criminalize protesting environmental destruction and racism in G20 summits. Why would you think what they're doing overseas, where fewer pictures get back to us, is helping? If you want to defend the innocent, why are you going abroad in search of dragons to slay like some crusader? Though we've been trained to think the systems that created the countries we were born in would never act unjustly, or maybe occasionally because a few bad apples who, you know, accidentally slipped through. But anyone who's been punished by the state for sure deserved it. So enforcing the state's word is good. Mm. Another over thereism I re hear regularly is Israel is not a legitimate state. That's an interesting one. First, what state is legitimate? Well, as I've explained in a bunch of videos, states legitimize themselves. Say, states don't wait for approval and consent. They either create it through propaganda, or they push ahead regardless of their unpopularity. The reason people hate on Israel is because it's a settler colonial state that regularly massacres part of the population it's occupying. Isn't that also a reason to hate the US, Canada, and Australia too? They might not kill or oppress as much, but the difference is a matter of degree. Israel has killed many thousands of people in building a state, but so do all states, especially settler states. And estimates that I can show, uh, the, that I can find at least, show that Saudi Arabia has killed way more people in Yemen than Israel has ever killed Palestinians. And as a state, it's not much older than Israel. But I don't hear people saying it's not a legitimate state. All states are the problem, folks, not just other ones. On that note, the supposed differences between democracy and dictatorship, which I've also done a video about, are also a big source of over-thereism. The propaganda was pretty blatant during the Cold War. The USSR, and in fact any state not allied with the US, was a dictatorship, while we have freedom and democracy. To most people, that alone was, the, was, was enough. That was the source of difference. That was the source of conflict. They're bad because we use a negative word to describe them. And we're good because we're a democracy. People will sign up to die on the other side of the world as long as someone tells them they're fighting against dictatorship and for democracy. But, but it couldn't possibly be a dictatorship here. So there's no need to fight for democracy at home. We have elections. We're taught it's right to go to war against dictatorship, but why not also go to war against, say, white supremacy? Isn't that a legitimate conflict too? 
Why is one of those words worth making war on while the other is acceptable? Well, because then we might have to go to war at home, and the people in power don't want that. Along the same lines, the idea of foreign rule is always more objectionable than rule by locals. On the one hand, foreign rule usually is more repressive and violent, but on the other, most post-colonial states aren't a whole lot better. People will fight revolutions to rid their land of a foreign occupier and usher in a local occupier. Why did you revolt in the first place? Wasn't it for freedom and justice? You don't get those things from a state just because the state has a more convincing claim to represent you. Fighting off a foreign enemy should include building up local strength to become independent of all rulers from everywhere. At all times and places, the ruling class will use the scary foreigner to manipulate its subjects. You'll see it when they're talking about foreign business practices, like how Huawei is stealing Americans' data but not the NSA, Google, and half your apps. You'll see it when they're trying to get votes. Vote for me because my opponent is a shill for China. And you'll hear the over there-ism shift into high gear when they're talking about war. You'll see it any time they want to trick and distract you, which is all the time. It's up to you to see through it and teach others to see through it, to strip the powers that be of their ability to trick you into working against your interests. Thanks.